yet live for all practical purposes as if he doesn't exist. I can live with my own struggles. I can live with the fact that my time, treasure, and talents are all mine. They all belong to me. And I can decide that uh, the scripture is totally optional. If I want to obey, I can. And if I don't want to obey, then that's totally permissible. So we reduce that word of God down to being totally optional. This is what we call masquerading. And you might find that this is the way that you're living. Well, I believe in God, but... And over the next few weeks, you're going to have a chance to fill in the blanks. Well, I believe in God, but... I don't need to talk much about Him at all. Certainly not to my friends. I believe in God, but I still worry all the time. I believe in God, but I want to be in charge of my own happiness. I believe in God, but I, I still carry a grudge. I believe in God, but he needs to understand that what's mine is mine. And over the next six weeks, we're going to have a chance to look at how can I close the gap to the point that I actually live like I say I believe. And we're going to start that process of looking at how we do that by taking a look at this portion of scripture over in Matthew chapter 22. Now in this story we have a, a man who has come to Jesus and uh, this guy is an expert in the law. And when we talk about being an expert in the law, we might think of him as a lawyer. And the original rabbis were the lawyers. They were the ones who studied the laws of God. They were the ones who interpreted the laws of God. They were the ones who determined how we actually live out those laws of God. And so here comes an expert in the law. And he says to Jesus, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So what he's saying is to know God is to love Him. To love God is to know Him. A very interesting verse over in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. It really helps us to... to see what Matthew has penned in the words of Jesus that's just got just a little twist to it. Here's what John writes. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. Now look at this. We know that we have come to know him, and this is conditional, if we obey his commands. The man who says, well I know him, but doesn't do what he commands, is a saint. And the truth is not in him. He's a masquerader. He's a Christian atheist. Professes one thing and lives as though God doesn't even exist. This is powerful. You understand that there's a real difference between believing in God and knowing God. A recent Gallup poll said that 90 4% of the people that they surveyed in America claim that they believe in God. But all you have to do is take a quick glance at the scripture and you begin to see as you look at our culture that it's obvious that we are nowhere near 94% who actually know God. They may believe in God, but belief in God is not the same as personal knowledge. Personally knowing God. So for many, the idea that you could know God on a relational level seems to be unrealistic and unattainable. And there are so many people who look at God the same way that we look at the present. We see his picture. We know who he is. We know some things about him. But to say that we really know him, we don't. And that's the way so many people look at God. They know things about him. They know about his character. To say that they really know him, they don't. 
And so there are people who know God by his reputation. Maybe they've been to church enough to, to get a good idea about who he is. Maybe they've heard some of the Bible stories, but everything's pretty much secondhand. And then there are those who, who know God in their memories. Because they've experienced God's goodness, they've experienced God's grace. At one time, they, they, they knew God intimately, and uh, somehow, like an old friend, they have lost touch. Now they can't say that they really know Him. And then there are others who know God intimately. Right here, right now, know Him personally. They're thirsty for God. And that hunger and thirst for God, as the Lord teaches us in His Word, if you, if you search for me with all of your heart, you will find me. If you hunger and thirst for me, I will fill you and quench that thirst. So that there are many who can say, I really do know him. I really know him. And there are some who would say, well listen, I mean I believe in God, isn't that enough? I mean there's, there's a lot of people who don't believe in God, and at least I do, and, and isn't that what he wants from me, that I would just believe in him? And you know what, that's, that's a fair question. But believing in God is just the beginning. Jesus' brother James writes to us, and he says, even the demons believe in God and tremble. And so the reason that Jesus zeroes in on this question that he's being asked is, hey, what's the bottom line? What's the core of the core? If we simplify it all down, what, what's the simplest thing that, just put it in just a nutshell, so he begins to say, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Now what he does is he reaches clear back to the Torah, the book of Deuteronomy, and he begins to quote there Deuteronomy 6, which is a very, very significant passage in the life of the Jewish people. And he begins to say, what we call the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. In other words, everything that's in you. These commandments that I give to you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. In other words, he's saying that, you know what, your conversation about the Lord and his, his person and the way he loves us and the way that he instructs us, all of that conversation should be just as common as the way we had conversation about who won yesterday and who lost yesterday in the football game. About whether or not the Blazers are ever going to have a season as if, as if they've ever had one anyway. That it should just be that kind of common language, common conversation. He goes on to say, you know what? I want you to, to take these words and tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your forehead. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. In other words, don't forget these words. They are life. They are sustenance. They are my love to you. And they will enable you to know me even better. Now what's interesting is the beginning passage of chapter 6 here in Deuteronomy, these are the commands, the decrees, the laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you're crossing, the Jordan, to possess. So that you, your children, their children, after them, they fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land formed with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. Imagine a football coach who has spent week after week after week after month working with his football team, countless hours of training, and has 
the times have come, he's had great discouragement as he's watched their lack of discipline. He has uh, listened to them murmur and complain. He has worked hard to bring them to, to the peak of all that he anticipated. And uh, he has worked hard to keep their focus on the, on the main thing. And at long last, the team is set and the hour has arrived for the first game. And as the team gathers in the locker room, the coach announces that he's been replaced. Someone else has been assigned to lead the team. What in the world would the coach say to that? That is the exact predicament that Moses is in. He's worked with them for 40 years, brought them through thick and thin, wept over them, complained to God about them, turned his resignation into God many times, only to have it turned down, gone back and fought for the people, fought with the people, lost sleep, but finally had brought them down to a point where they are ready to go into the promised land. It's game time. The Lord has told him, Moses, you're not going. I want you to raise up Joshua and present him to the people and you endorse him and embrace him, pass the mantle to him, and he's going to lead them on. And so as a part of Moses, locker room talk, kind of his farewell speech. We have the book of Deuteronomy. Probably written between a period of two and six weeks. He's penned these words because the Lord has said, I want you to review these things with the people before you leave. And so he's poured his heart out. And he says, these words are to be remembered. Remember God's words. And you're only going to remember them by hearing and by listening. You understand if you're a mother, there is a big difference. That's why you say to your kids, are you hearing me? Are you listening to me? Because you know what we're like. So he says, I want you to listen to these words. I want you to hear these words. I want you to remember that our God is the only true God who has brought you through thick and thin. He, he's watched over you through the wilderness. And he wanted these reminders to cause these people to be motivated in their love for the Lord. That's why he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with everything in you from the depth of their soul that they would come to know God and love God because Israel had known the Lord's love. That the Word of God was to be in their hearts. God's Word was to be a part of their daily living. Well, at this point, the Israelites knew the Lord, loved the Lord, were moved to obey the Lord. Moses didn't want the people to forget God's faithfulness, God's goodness that they had seen and that they had heard for the last 40 years. Many of you are familiar with one of the seven wonders of the world, which is the Taj Mahal. Go back to the 1600s by Shah Jahan as a monument, a memorial, for his most loved wife, who died giving birth to their 14th child. Well, I could understand why she would die. <laughs> so he decided that he would build a mausoleum. And if you know the story, you know that he made the announcement that he would build it right over here. So he had her casket brought and placed on the property where he would build that mausoleum to her memory. As time went by, he moved from his grief to his passion to build this. And one day while he's out with the construction workers, he trips over a wooden box and he tells his men, get that thing out of here. 
only to find out that that was the very casket of his beloved wife that he spent over 20 years building a monument to and in the midst of wanting to do something great he totally forgets the core of the core. Now I don't know what it is about us but I know that you know and I know that God knows and I know that I know we have a tendency to forget Would you just remind the person next to you? <laughs> and how we need timely reminders. Huh? Well, these people are all fired up and they're all so determined. But as time goes by, they begin to have an outward appearance. But their hearts began to grow cold. And they became God-professing atheists. They lived outwardly with many good practices, but inside lived as though God didn't even exist. And it's funny because the same thing began to happen as we begin to read through the New Testament. The Apostle Paul writes a letter to a church, a group of people in Galatia. And here's what he says to them. He says, formerly when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you want to be enslaved by them all over again? In other words, what he's saying is how soon you have forgotten. Who has gotten to you? Who has turned your mind the other way? Who has pulled your heart in a different direction? Until what I see is an outward <coughs> appearance and a heart that is rapidly changing. Now, I want to take you over to Hosea chapter 11. And you can turn there if you want. But if you decide, no, I don't just feel like turning because it's one of those really hard books to find. I want you to see these words because the word of the Lord is being spoken to this same group of people that Moses spoke to. It's just their downline. It's just their downline. Same children of Israel. And I want you to see these words. He said, you know, when Israel was only a child, I loved him. I called out my son. I called him out of Egypt. But when others called him, he ran off and loved me. He worshipped the popular sex gods. He played at religion with all the toy gods. Still, I, I stuck with him. I led Ephraim. I rescued him from human bondage. But he never acknowledged my help. He never admitted that I was the one pulling the wagon. That I lifted him like a baby to my cheek. Think about this. God is saying, you people, you my children, I can remember picking you up and, and, and holding you ever so dear to my cheek. He's never forgotten us. That I bent down and I, I would beat you. And now he wants to go back to Egypt or go over to Assyria, anything. <laughs> But return to me. That's why his cities are unsafe. The murder rate skyrockets and every plan to improve things falls to pieces. My people are hell-bent on leaving me. They pray to God Baal for help. He doesn't lift a finger to help them. How can I give up on you, Abraham? How can I turn you loose, Israel? How can I leave you to be ruined like Adam? Devastated like what was the boy. I can't bear to even think such thoughts. My insides churn and protest. And so I'm not going to act on my anger. I'm not going to destroy him. Why? Because I am God, not human. Thank God. I am the Holy One. I'm here. 
in your very midst. These are the same kids that we just read about in Deuteronomy. Do you hear God's heart in regards to his longing for relationship? Moving us so that we might live according to his word, not by our self-centered tendencies. That we might be regularly and continually reminded of his word and what he has to say and how he wants to capture our heart, our mind, so that we could proclaim and be what we proclaim. But there's this genuineness, this, there's this holiness that we smell like Jesus because we've been hanging around him so much. But not enough of us are, are stepping up to close the gap between who we profess to be and who we really are down deep inside. And so we masquerade and we miss out on living a more fulfilled life. Charles Spurgeon, that great preacher of old, had a fantastic phrase for this notion of masquerading, this gap. Here's what he said. He said, very often we live beneath our privilege. So very often we live beneath our privilege. We have this awesome privilege of being able to, to, to live like people who have a future who are forgiven, who have an identity and a security and a freedom. We've been given this fabulous gift by God to live this way and we just find ourselves living as though it really doesn't matter. Thank you, but no thanks. And we just think That's absolutely goofy. A crazy story, but I like it. Four wealthy boys decided to give their mother a wonderful gift. So the first son gave her an absolutely magnificent house, large. Second son spent $100,000 putting a theater room where she could just enjoy watching great programs. Because her eyesight had been failing terribly. And her hearing wasn't all that good, but she was still here. Third son said, I had my dealer deliver her an SL 600 Mercedes. And the fourth one said, well, you know, mom loves the Bible. Can't see all that well. Can't see well enough to read it anymore. So I bought her a 